time. So it's, um, it's a very broad in scope. It's not as, as in-depth as we go with all the other diseases. Um, I have all your prescriptions graded. I've got the heart and the pulmonary graded. Everybody will have to redo some. Everybody will have to redo the nitroglycerin. <laughs> so on Wednesday, I'll go over that. I, I, I'm gonna, I'll make face sheets like I did before, and I'll try to be more directive of, you don't have to redo all the names and everything. It'll be like the sick. Uh, you're really doing well. Some of this is getting it down to um, getting your verbiage uh, cleaned up. Some of it is getting to uh, indications, like Xarelto. What do we use Xarelto for? It's an anticoagulant. So most of you put on there atrial fib. So we don't use it to treat atrial fib, we use it to prevent strokes from atrial fib. So some of it is getting uh, more attention to detail, uh, is that. Some of it is the refills. A lot of the mistakes that you're making now are just going to cost you time down the road. Uh, it'll be phone calls. And believe me, it will drive me nuts. So when you make an error on a prescription, it involves your time, the pharmacist's time tracking you down, your, the nurses that work with you or your clerk, and that it'll be everybody's time, and the patient who has to sit there and wait on things to get cleaned up. So these are things that are, I think, correctable. Uh, some of them just don't follow the rules all the time, and that's, that's just the nature of the, of the beast. So anyway, I will go over those on uh, Wednesday. Overall, they, they look good, but you all make consistent. I can tell where Anitis has decided on how to do something, because if one makes a mistake, it's separated. <laughs> so it's fine, but just realize that if you make a collective decision, it does collectively get redone. So, <laughs> so yeah. It's, it's all good. I don't think it will take you a lot of time to redo it. And I'll, um, I'm trying to figure out whether on some of them to have you redo it on the paper and hand that back or whether to have you rewrite. I'm, I'm just trying to decide what's, what is going to get done that I feel like needs to be done. Not busy work. Don't, do not put in, a, in an evaluation that I have busy work because if it's you busy, it's me 33 times now busy. So whatever I do to you, I do double. 33rd, three times to myself. So, anyway, you're coming along well. Um, don't forget midterm on Thursday. I tell you, I do think the people who do the best do those quizlets, and they do them repeatedly. So I can look at that activity and see where you're. Not to spy on you, but just to kind of see what you're doing. But then I'll look at who does well. Usually they've done something. Like Anyway, uh, my dad had surgery this morning. He just went into recovery, and um, he's doing well. But it, I told my sister to call me if there was anything that I needed to hear. So she will text me. So if that happens, I will probably step out. And if it's something that would take some time at all, I'll come back and let you know. So they came out and said, good, good, good. But he's 90, so there are things that happen. Uh, so anyway. Um, just a heads up in case. Okay. So you're in the summer. You've made it through this. The, the spring to me is the hardest. The fall is hard, but you are much more, you're geared for it. You're geared for it. So it's pretty much the same, same, same from here on out. Okay. Good. So you've already done a week of, of uh, GI? You're in your second one. Okay. All right. So today we're going to start off with nutrition in the gut. Uh, this is one of those that we bumped from um, nutrition module. It probably fits better here, so it's probably not a bad thing that we did that. Uh, so the things that we're going to look at is we're going to look at celiac. We're going to look at lactose intolerance. Uh, we're going to look at um, the FODMAPs. Uh, dysphagia, I'm just going to mention so that you're aware that there are diets and they are based on what you order is uh, what, we, what the patient would get. We'll talk about probiotics and prebiotics. Oh, pancreatic supplements. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about food sensitivities uh, and fructose intolerance. 
So you talked about celiac disease. Okay, so what did you learn? Exactly. Very few people have it. It's an autoimmune disease. So autoimmune diseases don't tend to be very common. They, we tend to know about them because they're usually, it, they're, they see the, they interact with the medical system a lot. And they have lots of problems. The drugs, they have multiple drugs. Uh, so that's why, like type 1, you would think type 1 diabetes was the biggest thing. But it's actually this much of diabetes. And type 2 is this big. So you've got autoimmune disease everybody knows about because of, of how it affects the body. So it's the same with celiac. Uh, and people are just beginning to understand the last 10 years. If you have an autoimmune disease, you are more likely to have other autoimmune diseases. So celiac can sometimes go along with that. I'm going to focus mostly on adults. I'm not going to do kids. Uh, we'll talk about this again when we do type 1 in children because when you have uh, type 1 diabetes, we will usually eventually screen you for celiac if you have failure to thrive uh, or you become symptomatic after the diagnosis of type 1. So we'll talk mostly about uh, adults. Um, okay, so you've had it. Yes, didn't you talk about it this morning? No. no. I thought they were talking about celiac this morning. We talked about diverticulosis, lysis, and then ear Okay. All right. So, well, I'm glad I was going to skip this, but we'll talk about this then. So, an autoimmune disease affects 1% of the population, but I bet you a lot of people claim gluten uh, sensitivity uh, to a much higher extent. Hereditary, just like with some of the other autoimmune, if you're a first degree relative. So who's first degree? Mom, Mom siblings, dad. So parents, siblings. So if your grandmother had it, it's a more dilute pool. You're only 25% of the genetic uh, sharing of that, so it, it's uh, not a strong correlation. So it is when your body reacts to a protein called gluten. And when it does that, so you see the healthy villi, this is blurry, but I liked it. I liked the picture. So here's healthy villi. So you know the, the surface area of the small intestines is greatly increased by these villus uh, projections. So in celiac disease, what happens is that the attack is on those, those villi. And so it, it disrupts them, destroys them. So then you get these... You get decreased surface area and you have lots of symptoms, uh, GI symptoms due to that. So that's, that's in a nutshell what celiac disease is. The big thing to remember and what it, beyond the diet and controlling the symptoms is that what, what happens to the absorption, absorptive capacity of the intestines? It goes down. And inflammation always changes absorption of things. So these folks get nutrient deficient. The more severe their disease is, the more likely they're going to have significant vitamin and mineral uh, uh, malabsorption. So they are at risk for long-term diseases. So like osteoporosis, common with long-term. Especially if we're dealing with kids and you've got a lifelong. It is extremely important to work with a dietitian who is trained in dealing with celiac disease um, because the, it, it's getting a, it, it's not only teaching them how to deal with the disease and what, what foods to choose, but also how do you get in all of those other nutrients that are being missed and, and then you working from a supplement standpoint. We always like to get nutrients out of foods rather than trying to supplement. But we do have supplements if we can't get it through uh, diet. So the big offenders are wheat, barley, rye. So there's a lot of um, wheat related. And I don't claim to be a an expert in this at all, except through patients would come in and go, I, what do you, you know, asking what they eat, carbohydrates, so all I eat smelt, that's like, smelt, it's like, what is that? <laughs> so I have, I learned by 
by trial and error. So these are varieties and derivatives of wheat. Not as common, but uh, if you go to Sprouts, you can find these in most of the bins. So if people are doing, uh, making their food from scratch, they may be using this kind. Taylor, chime in any time you Did you deal with celiac disease? Oh, she loves this. She <laughs> So these are some of the other gluten-containing foods. So what do you see up there that surprises you? The beer. Okay, so why is beer up there? Okay, so a bar barley, malt. So malt is, uh, is malt a wheat? Do you know? Is that a strawberry? It's a malt. That's why I put it up there. So strawberry malt. Uh, ruse, so ruse gravies, if you're there in the south, white gravy, <laughs> flour. Uh, so um, the other is if dis distilled spirits usually have the, any kind of wheat removed, but beer is not distilled. Vinegars that are, I guess there's malted vinegars, uh, they also have gluten. Uh, so that's why you need a dietitian who is trained in this, that can teach them. Uh, the, uh, right now, pharmaceuticals don't have to declare gluten, but I saw an FDA uh, call. Uh, what they do, when the FDA is going to put out a guideline, they'll usually make a call, they'll, they'll put out what they call a call, and they'll say, this is what we're planning to do. We're planning to look at a gluten advisory for the industry. And what they're talking about is the pharmaceutical industry. And so then they'll, they'll invite questions and comments and all of this, and then they'll put their advisory together and they'll publish it. So they did that back in December, and I think they ended that call in February. So there should be something going out to the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we, had, we went through this with lactose years ago, because we use milk solids in d different pharmaceuticals, and patients who are lactose intolerant had symptoms. So there's one going out now for pharmaceuticals. So not everything that's got gluten has to be, uh, has to be identified that way. Let's skip down and I'll come back. Look at the middle of page two under food labeling. Gluten free is there, so the, the FDA has defined it. They've said you can say you're gluten free if you're less than uh, 20 parts per million. But the FDA doesn't go in and test these products. So they are relying on the manufacturer because they are held to, uh, if you have a food that comes under FDA regulation, Food Drug Administration, then you have to be truthful in what you put on your labeling. So if you're saying you're gluten-free, you have to meet that. But nobody goes in and tests it. See the difference? Okay. So there are organizations uh, that, um, have to say I don't I've read I've read but I don't understand how they what their um, um, what their guidelines are so there are groups that certify things as gluten-free uh, and they <coughs> look for products that have under 10 parts per million so I guess there was a distrust that people actually were putting out gluten-free material or products and so these groups will come out and certify it is not a government certification, it's these organizations. Do you know anything about them? It is very hard to find out much about them. So I don't know how much stock I put in a label, because they have a label they'll put on a product that says certified gluten. That is an independent organization, it is not government regulated. For whichever you think is important. Wheat free does not mean gluten free. Okay. Um, Allergy listing. So there are like eight different allergens that label, um, that people will put on the label. 
Um, so milk, eggs, peanuts, uh, soy, uh, gluten is one of them. But rye, barley are not. Okay? So something could have those in there, but it wouldn't be listed as an allergen. So pick up your food products, look at them. At the very bottom of the ingredient list, it'll have allergens, and they'll put them in bold uh, underneath. Okay. But realize it's not a complete list, so patients would be taught not to rely on that. Uh, let's see. Foods that are covered, all FDA-regulated foods. Not all foods are regulated by the FDA. Uh, dietary supplements will fall in there, so that's good. And imported food products that are sub, sub, uh, subjugated to the FDA. But look on the next page, top of three. So meats, poultry, eggs, unshelled eggs, not regulated. They're USDA. Distilled spirits and wines that have 7% or more alcohol by volume. Malted beverages, malted uh, barley and hops. So still things out there that can make people sick uh, that uh, wouldn't necessarily be labeled as such. Okay. Let's go back then to the first page. So celiac disease can't be cured. Um, it's avoiding the gluten that is going to control symptoms. Um, can affect people of any age. So it isn't just children. Any, any age group could be affected. So the classic definition, sorry, these are not my forte. I put this in more for um, completeness. So it's villus atrophy, the symptoms of malabsorption. So steatorrhea, what is that? Uh, uh, fat in the stool. Weight loss, nutrient vitamin deficiency. So like in kids with type 1, if they start to manifest this, we will do an antibody test to see if they've got antibodies against uh, Tissues, tissue that would reflect that they've been uh, ahead of the antibody attack. So resolution of mucosal lesions and symptoms upon withdrawing gluten usually takes a few weeks to a month. The gut is an amazing organ. It can adapt, but it adapts slowly. So if you move from one part of the country to another, different water, different food types. If you've ever gone overseas and, and, and eaten other foods in a developed country, your gut usually will react to that. Um, we'll talk about it in diabetes. Uh, when we use certain drugs, they'll cause GI symptoms early on, but your gut adapts. So it's a very adaptable organ, but it is slow. Uh, so it can take months for it to adapt to a new way of you eating or drinking. Okay. So patients, classic disease, diarrhea, weight loss, malabsorption. So there's a couple of ways we can do it. You can do it clinically based on symptoms. Or you, and you can also look at antibodies. So gliden and transglutaminins, which is what I most uh, uh, have seen mostly with the endos that I have worked with. Look at the conditions that people are more likely to get. So osteopenia, osteoporosis. So their ability to absorb calcium decreases. Vitamin D decreases. It, remember those fat-containing or fat-soluble uh, vitamins. Okay, what are they? Name them. A, A, D, E, and K. Yeah, it's like two, seven, nine. <laughs> okay. So A, D, E, and K. So they, if you can't absorb fat, then you lose those vitamins. Now your body stores them up for a long time, so it may be a while before the deficiencies show up, but they will eventually show up. Iron deficiency anemia, so they're having trouble absorbing iron. Type 1, it's a common uh, comorbidity. Um, thyroid problems, so hypothyroidism is also an autoimmune disease and, and can be seen in people with celiac. Skin disease called uh, dermatitis hepatiformis. Uh, nervous system disorders, again, due to the nutrient problems in liver disease. So the, this, these kinds of, you may see these folks as adults and see these types of um, complications coming about. But if you're dealing with younger patients or new onset, then you're going to want to do things to prevent those. 
So I want you to put that association together, nutrient deficiency. So it's not only the acute symptoms that make them uncomfortable, but it's the long-term malabsorption uh, process, uh, problems that are associated with it leads to the complications. I want you to make that connection. Okay. Management, get them into a dietitian. Lots of patient education, lots of trial and error, uh, lots of learning. Um, I have several, I know several people that have celiac disease, and they've got other, they've got lupus and other autoimmune diseases. But, like, I never appreciated cross-contamination. Uh, so that came about when we first started doing communion. You know, we started doing uh, gluten-free wafers and then the other, but then we had to put them in a separate uh, container because if it touches the other. See, I, I didn't know all that. So there's lots, lots for them to learn. Lifelong adherence to a gluten-free <coughs> diet. Um, and then access to an advocacy group. I gave you three uh, that are recommended. They are all very different. I'll tell you the first one from a provider standpoint I like the most. Uh, the last one is very much an advocacy group. They're, they're very um, uh, uh, into regulations and, and uh, watching groups and um, getting news out, but it wasn't as informative um, as to me as a provider. Uh, as I found the first one. So that celiac.org I like the most. But all three of them are very different. Then they need long-term follow-up, especially as those complications come about uh, in dealing with it, especially if you can't get the drug in, or you have to refer them to a specialist who can administer the drug in a way that they can absorb it. So a lot of more IV, getting around the gut. Okay. Questions about those? I have a question. Yes. So if, um, so see, like, we haven't, like, actually talked about it yet, but it says that to be gluten-free, you have to be less than 20 parts per million. So if they're sensitive to that, is that setting the manufacturers up for, like, a liability if they have a reaction mm -hmm. to it? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Why is that? Why would that be? Mm -hmm. How many of you worked in a lab? Okay. Okay, so why would that be... What, what would strike you about the fact that they set uh, the, the sensitivity at less than 20 parts per million? Okay, so it depends on how, how much can you measure. If that's the most reliable that on the low end that you can measure, then that's where they set the goal. So a lot of it's going to go to what can they detect. Okay. So you're talking about 20 in a million. So you'd have to, so most people probably are going to tolerate that, I would think. Because um, you can't get away from everything else unless you become the boy in the bubble. Yeah. You ever see that movie? Yeah. <laughs> I think the issue with that too is that, it, I mean, and as far as gluten-free diets, you really want to focus on eating whole, raw food and not packaged gluten-free things because, I mean, I've seen patients that, have ate so, like, eaten so many packaged foods, and that could add up over time, mm -hmm. potentially, where I think that's the issue. So you want to focus more on not just like going to the store and buying packaged gluten-free foods, but eating raw food that's naturally mm -hmm. gluten-free. Yeah, good point. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you're dealing with children, you've got to have a dietitian because if you've got one person in the family that eats <coughs> different from everyone else, then you have to bridge that gap. Uh, does everybody in the family eat like that? Well, possibly, uh, but getting that, because uh, it causes rifts in families. You can see it. One child is different. One person in the family is different. Uh, so it wears and tears depending on how resource uh, rich they are and how much they can afford and how much time they can, they can put to it. Okay, treatment, page three. So cornerstone is elimination of gluten in the diet, so it's those three sources, wheat, rye, barley. So learning what other things can be substituted. So lots of different flours can be used. Um, soybean, tapioca, rice, corn, buckwheat, potatoes. Um, reading the labels, some emulsifiers and stabilizers are used, but they use a wheat-based um, product. So learning which ones to avoid there, how to read a label. Uh, we talked about the alcohols. Dairy products. So dairy products usually don't contain gluten, but a lot of those patients may have symptoms if they are on lactose-containing products.
So sometimes removal of that and reintroducing the, the products that have uh, lactose may help in uh, figuring out where the, the, the problems are in the diet. Uh, fresh corn, fresh potatoes, nuts, seeds in their shells, dried lentils, dried beans, those are safe. Oats are the, and I would like to hear your comments on this. So oats are one of those that uh, can cause, uh, especially if people have severe disease, can uh, elicit symptoms. So the recommendation is to stay with 50 to 60 grams. People who have um, mild disease usually can tolerate it. I guess there are gluten-free oats uh, that you can also look for. You want to say anything yeah, about Yeah, usually I would take a patient off of those at first, but sometimes the body can kind of, like a cross-contamination cross or like a molecular mimicry kind of thing yes, with those. Yes. And then you can retry them, like the gluten-free oats, and see how they do. But. So patients should be tested for these deficiencies. Probably depends on the severity of the disease and how long it's been going. So vitamins A, D, E, we talked about those fat soluble, the B vitamins, so you can see where the neurologic problems come if you are deficient of those for a while, B1, B6, B12. Then the more trace minerals, so copper, zinc, magnesium, carotene, folic acid, ferritin, iron, selenium. Okay. So you start to see where iron deficiency anemia will come up. And then um, if you're deficient enough in those with uh, vitamin K, then you can see prolongation of prothrombin in people who are not on an anticoagulant. Um, so that would be severe disease. Okay, so keep those in mind, those are important. Any questions or comments just from what you hear out of your friends or on the media? Really, this is a hot topic. It's it's cool to be eat gluten free. Really yes, it's true. I yes. know that some people choose to be gluten free and they don't claim to have celiac. But those people who do have celiac, like diagnosis wise, I know that this is more plain med, so I apologize. But diagnosis wise, like, what is a definitive antibody? Antibody is like yes. the only one. Yes. Yes. Okay. Biopsy. Yes. Yes. And biopsy, yes. I was diagnosed with um, antibody screening and consulting. That was enough for my blood levels were high enough that they were like, stop. And symptoms. Yeah, you can do a biopsy. You have anything else to add? Anything else? Thank you. Okay. All right. Lactose intolerance. Not an allergy. So lactose is made up of two <laughs> sugars, so what do we call that? Disaccharides. So it's made up of two monosaccharides, lactose and glucose. So these folks have a, a genetic deficiency. They cannot make the enzyme that will metabolize lactose into those monosaccharides. So what happens is it gets into the colon where it gets uh, fermented, and then you get all the symptoms from that. So the bloating, the gas, the diarrhea. Uh, usually those symptoms, and people are lactose intolerant, usually those symptoms occur pretty quickly after they, uh, they eat those products. Uh, it is genetically, uh, it's ethnically um, uh, common, especially in African, Amer African Americans. So I was thinking about this the, uh, last night when I was looking this over, it's like African Americans, so most of my, pa my patients did not drink milk. And they could all eat ice cream. <laughs> uh, I think they just tolerated, they would tolerate the symptoms of ice cream, but the milk they would um, So clinical symptoms of um, lactose intolerance, abdominal pain, lots of gas production, diarrhea after they eat those products, uh, and that's that lactose malabsorption. Uh, so it can result from low lactase levels. It can be due to mucosal injury. Inflammation uh, can also do this. Uh, the rate limiting, lactose digestion, uh, rate limiting step for overall absorption of those, uh, those monosaccharides. Uh, So in 
management on the top of page four. So the FDA has no labeling for lactose. For all these products that say they are lactose free, there is no definition by the FDA. They are putting that on the product themselves. Now they are still held to tell the truth. So they, there's truth in advertising as far as the FDA is concerned. So if you put that on there, it, ought, it, should, um, it should be true. Um, so the, the big problem with, with lactose intolerance is how do you maintain calcium and vitamin D? Um, so again, if you've got somebody who's got severe and really restricted, if you've got pregnant women or you have people who are very restricted, again, bringing in a dietitian I think would be helpful. Um, so avoiding lactose usually is the, is the key. Uh, different um, dairy products contain different amounts. If you look at that uh, chart, you'll see lots of different variants depending on serving size and how much lactose uh, is in it. So you see that for milk, it's about 4 to 5%, but if you look at ice cream, it's 6%, even though there's less in there, it's a very small amount that you're looking at. So here are some of the different products. Lactate has a whole range of, of products. Uh, Green Belly has a lot. They're easy to find. Sprouts carries these. Uh, Yoplait, I haven't seen the lactose-free Yoplait, but I haven't really looked for it. But Green Belly, I, I see it quite a bit. Almond milks, the different nut milks uh, would also uh, work in there. So some of when you're treating lactose intolerance, some of it is better for people that go a long time without eating any kind of lactose or a reduced amount usually will have more symptoms. So a more daily intake is usually better than intermittent. They'll, they'll, be more, they'll have more of a response. Uh, there are lactate or lactose um, products. Here's two of them, Lactate and Dairy Ease are on the market. Dairy Ease also has all kinds of products that you can, uh, you can purchase that uh, also have reduced lactose content. So with these products, you can put them into milk, let it sit for a period of time, and then it will reduce the lactose content. On the top of page five, calcium and vitamin D. Uh, so making sure they're, they are eating other calcium-rich foods. So in, in nutrition, we talked about this. So what would be alternatives? What are calcium-rich foods that are alternatives? Spinach. Kale. What else? I hate those, so what would it what would you tell me? <laughs> I, I'm not saying that, but if your patients are staring at you like, really, really, you think I'm going to eat those? I like calcium fortified almond milk and stuff. Okay, so the almond milk, calcium, calcium fortified. fortified. It has a, is it I, some I, bread calcium fortified? Huh? Bread? Is it some of it calcium fortified? Mm, I don't think of bread being calcium fortified. There's a product on the market called right. um, Fair Life Milk, which oh, is yeah. lactose and free, and it has. Fair Life is? Mm -hmm. Really? The ultra filt uh, filtrated is lactose free? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And it is higher calcium mm -hmm. content than even regular milk. That's yeah. right. And almond milk is higher calcium content. Mm -hmm. um, okay, what else? Sardines? No. Oh, <laughs> <God. laughs> Sardines and olive oil? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Soybeans, eggs, or eggs? What calcium content? Anything we missed? Any other big group? No, just the dark leafy greens. Can't be calcium for it. Yes, it can be fortified. Anything else? So the dark leafy greens. Okay. So for kids, there is a liquid uh, calcium gluconate, just a different salt that can be used. Know your amounts of calcium. So it changes, what changes calcium intake? Or recommendations? Age, okay, gender, okay. So be aware of those. So the younger you are up until about 35, you really, uh, that's when your bones are laying down the most minerals, so keep that in mind. The other thing, we did touch on this, I'll, I'll do it again when we talk about osteoporosis, is the amount of calcium that, calcium that can be absorbed is limited by the amount you take in. 
So if you're going to take a calcium supplement instead of eating it through your diet, you need to break it up. So about 500 milligrams at one time is, is what uh, is recommended. Again, it's the, it's the elemental base that we're worried about, not the salt. Remember, there were different percentages. Mm -hmm. What was the highest calcium product that had the highest amount of calcium? Calcium salt, highest amount. Are you slept there? Yeah. 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 That's a problem. Calcium carbonate, 40%. <laughs> okay, questions to that? Have you talked about, um, well, you haven't, you, you've had stroke? No. Talked about stroke? No. Talked about dysphagia? Okay. Well, so what's dysphagia mean? Difficult swallowing. Okay. So people who have difficulty swallowing, what are they at risk for if they don't, can't swallow well? Aspiration. Aspiration pneumonia. Okay. So depending on the degree of the dysphagia, then you need to make the food uh, as the most likely that they can swallow it uh, and not aspirate it. Uh, so there are, there is a national dysphagia diet, comes in four stages, uh, one being the, the most uh, soft. So pureed foods. So mashed bananas, pudding consistency, baby food consistency, mashed potatoes. Uh, they have beverage thickeners uh, to help uh, increase the ability to swallow. Uh, so pudding-like texture, little chewing required. Level two is a mechanically soft diet. So oatmeal, fruit, pancakes with syrup. <laughs> and then there is um, level three, which is a, the advanced. So the, here you're getting closer to normal. This kind of shows you um, on the, let's see, let's see. on your left, uh, foods that are uh, recommended and then on foods to avoid. So you can see those require more chewing, more breaking down we would avoid. Level four would be a regular diet. What you normally do. You want to say anything about dysphagia diets? I want you to be aware of them. So if you see people are on them, uh, probably unless you work in rehab or in stroke or something, it wouldn't be something you would normally uh, recommend. But what do you be aware of? We would uh, find a lot of times in the hospital that they would be on it just like a level one, two, or three just patient diet sometimes. For what? Uh, Say it again. I, I didn't hear the very oh, first thing you said. We would see them a lot when I was rotating doing my clinicals in the hospital. So. Yeah. Well, you will see them use like, depending on what's going on with the patient, mm -hmm. uh, they may use like a mechanically soft, mm -hmm. they won't call it a dysphagia diet yeah. but, or a soft diet. Uh, so when people, like my diabetics, lose all their teeth, then we go to like a, a phase one or, or level one dysphagia diet and work them up until they get their teeth. Okay, probiotics. So what do you know about these? Y'all have got to come alive. The more you respond and interact with me, the, e the better the teacher I am. <laughs> it's true. The, the better teachers are people who have responsive uh, audiences. When I am having to work to pull you out, or I'm sitting here going, you're as deadpan as you can be, and I know you're tired, but the more you will interact and even facially interact with me, <laughs> I, I'm better. It's true. Okay, so what do you know about probiotics? Another trendy thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Isn't that probiotics feed bacteria? Yeah. 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 So, so they're organisms. Yeah. Yeah. Organisms that may help. What did you say, Sarah? That may help. The normal flora in your gut. May may help the normal flora in the gut. What else do you know? You need a certain amount, right, for them to be effective. You need a certain amount to be effective. Some, well, some doctors prescribe them with antibiotics. Yeah, some are prescribing with antibiotics. Why do they do that? Okay, so it wipes out the normal floor, so they're thinking that that will restore it. Okay, what else? 
but probiotics in yogurt. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so our foods naturally, what are probiotics? What are probiotics? Bacteria. They're bacteria, the normal gut bacteria. So you have, you live in a, in a relationship with these the bacteria in your gut that help with digestion. Okay, yes. Does that have to be like live agriculture for it to be effective? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. So you all have heard most of the things that are out there uh, circulating, and so we're going to talk about today where the, the data. You talked about evidence-based medicine? Yes. yes. Okay, so at the end we'll talk about what the evidence is for them. What are prebiotics? They feed the probiotics. Okay. So give me an example of, of something that would feed your probiotics. Persistent starches. Somebody said fibers and sauerkraut the other day. Uh, yeah, that's true for minutes foods. What did you say? Fiber and resistant starches. Fiber and resistant starches. Where what would be a source of a resistant starch? Green banana. Green bananas. I love them. They have a, a certain type of starch. Why do I like green bananas? But they're really good for you. They may be tasteless, but I'm telling you the resistant starch in them is really good for you. I love them. I love them. Some people even feel it decreases diabetes risk the more you the more you eat. So isn't it called resistant? Resistant. Resistant. So Think about it. I always search for the greenest bananas. The guys love me. As they're unloading them, like, I want your greenest bananas. <laughs> I do. I love them. Um, okay, so the, the FDA and the World Health Organization define probiotics as live organisms which, administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit to the host. So they're talking about external instead of what we have already. Uh, disruption of the normal epithelial barrier leads to inflammation, which changes your gut microbiome. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in inflammatory diseases of the gut, like ulcerative colitis, uh, palchitis. Y'all talked about these? No. Okay. And Crohn's disease. They're looking at these as adjuncts uh, to uh, the, the uh, drugs that are already there. Uh, so we talked about prebiotics being dietary components, probiotics the beneficial. We talked about fecal transplants. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, page six. Um, so these are the uh, so the probiotics, the friendly, the good bacteria. They defend uh, you from lots of bad things from the outside. Uh, let's talk about gut health and how it affects the body. Well, there are certain things that when you eat, they get turned into uh, metabolites or factors that can then harm you, uh, can harm the liver, can harm, and here's those are two red meat and eggs that can harm the heart. Uh, so TMAO, so people eat a lot of those then uh, can uh, hurt their kidneys as well. Brain, so there's a lot of, of uh, interest right now in looking at how does the gut affect what how you feel, think? Usually they tell us if they're going to test it. That is a <laughs> so they're thinking that some of those gut hormones feedback can influence the brain, how we think. So they're looking at it in depression, uh, autism. There's been a long, long history of looking at foods and how they affect autistic uh, symptoms. Obesity. People who are obese, obese versus lean have different gut makeup. Uh, and they've looked at if they, in fecal transplants, if they transplant the gut uh, organisms into an obese person from a lean person, they do better on a diet. Wait, what? So they take fecal transplants from people who are lean into obese and they find that they do better on diets. Okay, so they're looking at, there's a lot of interest in diabetes right now about is, is, the, is what happening in our gut causing diabetes or adding to it. 
Pardon? Type 2. Type two. <laughs> well, they, no, they don't know how, but they, it's different, it's different organisms. You want to add anything here? So, can the gut bacteria be changed? Well, your baby's gut by, you were born with, and influenced greatly by your mother. So, another thing when you're dealing with pregnant women is eat well. Eat good foods. People can do a lot in a pregnancy for a short period of time it's if it's influencing somebody else. They quit smoking, they can eat foods that they never did, they can give up their caffeine and all kinds of stuff that they normally wouldn't do. Uh, dairy, so sources, so it's influenced by what you eat. Your dairy products, here's your fermented vegetables, uh, kimchi and sauerkraut, pickled vegetables, onions and gherkins. Dr. Britt loves sweet gherkins. <laughs> I like dill. They're a little bitty. They're the little bitty gherkins. Uh, little bitty. Huh? What? Baby pickles. Baby pickles. She's like, no. I like baby pickles. I always like the sour. Okay, let's look at the types of uh, probiotics. So here is one thing to start to pay attention to, is that if you, so let's go through these first. So you've got bacteria and yeast. The lactobacillus, if you look at your yogurt, they'll be in there. Uh, I, you know, and I don't know exactly how to say this, but bifido, 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 bifido these will be in your dairy products as well. May help to ease symptoms of IBS. Um, the uh, sacro, sacro, how do you say that? Saccharomyces boulardii. One more time. <laughs> Sac, sacro, Saccharomyces boulardii. So a yeast. Bacillus coagulans, that's in a lot of the, uh, like the fermented little drinks like kefir and... Uh, Pardon us? Yes. Uh, which are about? Uh, the E. coli strain this will, uh, 1917 and the, e. uh, the Enterococcus uh, fascium SF68. Okay. So those are in a lot of the probiotic products. Prebiotics, food components, so they would be non-digestible carbohydrates. They're listed out there for you. Ingredients on the uh, food label, the lacto-oligosaccharides. Fructo oligosaccharides, oligofructose, chicory, or inulin. Recommended daily intake is five grams. Maybe I'll add this next year to the diet of that analysis that'll blow your mind. How much prebiotic do you eat? Okay. So health benefits, it enhances bioavailability, uptake of minerals, lowers the risk of heart disease, promotes satiety, weight loss. Using them together, we call them symbiotics. So here's the deal. Very little data out there on, on with evidence that they do anything for diseases. Here's a few where there is some data. One is acute infantile diarrhea. Probiotics as an adjunct to rehydration therapy has demonstrated evidence. Antibiotic associated diarrhea. Common in practice, not a lot of data. They may be effective in reducing the incidence of antibiotic-induced uh, diarrhea, but there is just not the data. So here's the deal. How do you know which, which bacteria you knock out? How do you know that if the study says we use bacto, what, what's the first one? Lactobacillus, and you tell them to go out and get a probiotic, and they choose another, one, how do you know that that species has anything to do with the species that it, you've wiped out? There isn't. That's the problem. You cannot generalize the, the information. So studies are very specific in which species they use and how much they administer. If you do not administer the same or in the same amount, you cannot claim that you have the evidence that that is going to help. So this common practice of giving it with antibiotics, I'm telling you, there's no data behind it. 
you are wasting people's money, in my personal opinion, because they're expensive. You ever bought pre uh, probiotics and prebiotics? They're expensive. So you're adding to the expense and you're complicating the therapy. And you have no evidence that it does anything uh, beyond or uh, as compared to doing nothing. Okay? The other is that you don't even know if it gets down into the gut. There is evidence that your natural that your the, your gut uh, bacteria kill off these once they get there. The other is if you're looking at Crohn's and UC, you have no guarantee that those uh, those antibiotics or those probiotics get to the site of where you need them. So I think in your lifetime, what will happen? There's lots of good work being done with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, and I think there's probably something to it that if you can. Uh, change the bacterial composition just looking at the studies that, that it will probably help in the response to therapy. What they're going to have to do is package those probiotics in a way that will deliver them to where the problem is. Okay. So Hannah's hand up. Oh, I was, I've been told to like eat yogurt when you have some antibiotics. Is that something that still goes with no data or they still don't No data. They're just, but it's, it's got the probiotics in it. So, but there is nothing to, there's, there's no data I know from diet. But practice trends, I would work with, would recommend them, but if, I think it kind of depending on absorption, and sometimes with um, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's patients, they would actually recommend uh, probiotic suppositories. But, I don't know. Okay, I just tell you, I do think that something will come up this, but I, you've really got to look at the data. That you're, you're recommending stuff that has no evidence behind it. And it's the expense. They're very expensive. Okay, traveler's diarrhea, maybe. So they're looking at a lot of things, like especially diarrhea related uh, to C. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome, there's lots of interest in probiotics there. They may help with some of the abdominal bloating and, and pain. Don't routinely recommend them because they don't have the data. Ulcerative colitis. Crohn's, there's no, there's, there's really very little data, but there are some small studies in ulcerative colitis that show promise. I put three of them down there for you. Um, so in a mild uh, UC, E. coli 1917 was as um, effective as mesalamine, which is the foundation of treatment. So that's promising. Uh, using the BSL uh, number three, which is a uh, like a super strain of eight. Uh, different uh, probiotics. That with uh, the salazide, which is another mesalamine-like uh, product, affected in, in mild to moderate. Uh, the big thing with UC that you want to do is you want to get them to remission. That's your first goal. Uh, so it looks like in, in the use of some of these products, it got them to remission faster. So I would watch UC. I think that there is, there's probably some good uh, products that are going to come out of that and better data uh, down the road. The other thing you have to think about is that those organisms can may cause disease. So in the immunocompromised, people have severe uh, or in, are nutritionally deplete. You don't know what you're doing. So, so I'm saying evidence is not there to back you up. I have just a small one. Yes. So I've got to get you on the nutrition side, but more on the bacterial side. And they're still really, I don't know, I want to say, they're asking the question of chicken before the egg. If a lot of this is happening, um, the bacterial colonization of the gut because of the disease, or if, uh, you know, the other way around. So I don't know. Based on what I know from literature before coming here, they're still making it into finding if you adjust the flora, the disease, you know, alleviate symptoms or the way around. Yeah. Um, See, there's lots of, it's, the, it's just the jump in the trend mm -hmm. um, without the science behind it. And they are supplements, so they are not regulated by the FDA. Now, not that I think the FDA is the be-all, end-all to everything, but they don't have to demonstrate that what's in there is in there. They have, are held to good manufacturing practices. They cannot claim, the FDA has not yet uh, authorized or given um, 
any approval to a probiotic for treatment. Okay, so you still got data that needs to be done. So again, it goes to specifically the organism they're using, how much they're using, does it even survive once it gets there, and, and can you deliver it to the source of the problem? Those are the big things. Nobody's got those answers. Questions? I have a question. So you see kinds that are refrigerated and then kinds that are just on the shelves. And I've yes. heard that refrigerated are better. I, why? I mean, is that just well, because that of survivability? Well, that number three is a, is a refrigerated one. Okay. So it just uh, depends on the strand? It yeah. depends on probably who's making it. Okay. Um, and then we have the bacteria. We would always Yeah. I figured that was probably it. But. I don't know, that VSL number three, it's, it's a vice biome, this biome, they call it the living shield. <laughs> it's great, great marketing. Okay, uh, lactose intolerance, uh, so there is some uh, interest in here. Uh, it may be that the lactobacillus and the streptococcus uh, thermophiles are uh, helpful as we're, as Bifido? Mm -hmm. Bifido. Bacterium longum and uh, acidophilus. Okay. So I would say stay tuned. I think you'll see good things down the road come out. Because I think they'll figure out how to deliver them. And then once they figure out how they deliver them and know if they survive, then they can do studies to figure out whether or not uh, they make any difference. Um, cancer would be another one that I would be concerned about in terms of immunosuppressant. Uh, in, in using these. Obesity, here's the, what I kind of jumped to early on. Microbial population differs between lean and obese people. Obese people lose weight when their microflora becomes more like lean people. And again, they think it has to do with those gut hormones. Varelin is uh, one that they are looking at in particular. Commercial products, uh, mostly I, I've said a lot of uh, this already. So the bottom line is which bacteria are the results generalizable, amounts uh, given, survivability, and the amount needed. And then what do we do with the immunocompromised folks? Okay, so did that make your day? <laughs> Why did it make your day? Okay. <laughs> Eat good, good prebiotics. I think the date, at least there, we know that that is probably better. Okay. All right. Well, let's take a break. We'll come back at it. It is hot in here. It's so hot. Yeah. Oh, honey. Stop eating honey. Yeah. <laughs> 